Stock's still having a little bit of trouble. We've got 40 minutes left, though, and the NASDAQ has repaired some of its early losses. Joining us, Michael Cugino at the portfolio, Permanent Portfolio Family of Funds as a President and Portfolio Manager. Mike, welcome back. Happy New Year. Good afternoon, all. We're good to see you again. Appreciate that. Tell me about how you're viewing this year as uh, we just closed out 2023 with a bang, and now since we flipped the calendar over to 24, things have kind of fizzled. Yeah, it seems like a morning after kind of feeling at the moment anyway. Um, and I think that that's just due to the uncertainty regarding a variety of factors, be it the Fed interest rates, um, the, the other global central banks and interest rates, geopolitical issues, the state of the economy. Um, your last guest was alluding to the fact that, you know, maybe the consumer may not be as strong this year. And then where does the liquidity to keep funding growth that we had in 23 come from? if it's not the consumer. Um, and so I think those are all real factors and fears. And, and as a result, the market's considering them um, as we kind of try to get some clarity on, on what's going to happen this year. Seems like in the equity side uh, that you've got some confidence in some of the big giants, but you've also got a pretty good smattering of non-mega caps in your approach. Take me through the equity side of your portfolio first. Well, we, yeah, we run a very diversified model that goes well beyond stocks and bonds, as you know, precious metals, real estate, uh, commodities, et cetera. But on the equity side, what we try to do is look at a way to, with our equity sleeve, if you will, to try to beat the broad equity market. And it's a multi-cap strategy. So we're looking at what we think are, you know, 30 to 50 great opportunities, regardless of cap size, and in a variety of industries and playing on some major trends you know, trends that we think are going to occur in the next three to five years. Uh, we are long-term investors. We have low turnover. We're not active traders. We're more buy and hold, hoping to get long-term gains. And so, yeah, what you end up with is a variety of industry groups, a variety of cap sizes, and uh, and companies doing different things. So uh, very obvious in our portfolio. You can, you can pair up a Facebook, for example, with uh, something like a Costco or a uh, Freeport McMoran or uh, something on the smaller cap size, you know, as well. How much of the small cap market, and as you kind of move down the market cap, which in the last couple of years, or maybe even more, has kind of equated to moving down the quality spectrum, just from a financial kind of balance sheet perspective, how much of that does depend on a big change in policy, a loosening of policy next year, do you think? Well, I mean, st when, when the cost of capital is high, I mean, I think sometimes smaller cap companies get get left, be, you know, for obvious reasons. They're not as liquid. They're not as big. Um, when the cost of capital is high, it costs you more to make a bet on smaller companies. And so maybe you pull back on those sorts of investments. When interest rates go down, you know, the, the reverse happens. And we've seen that occur in equity trading, you know, in many years, including last year. Um, if the Fed is close to being done or done and they follow through on what the market expects would be to which would be to cut rates a few times in 24, then you would expect smaller and mids to probably outperform in a variety of industries for that reason. Um, but you're also playing that off of at the moment. We don't know that. We don't know when. In fact, some of the market sell off this week is due to uncertainty regarding whether it's the Fed or the other central banks. Um, when these cuts may occur. So we don't know. And there is an argument for higher for longer interest rates, which means that they may not occur for a while. So there is some value in, in the larger companies as well. I mean, the reasons the, the Magnificent Seven and, and other bigger cap companies did well last year is because they are growing revenues. They are making cash money quarter to quarter. And investors are attracted to companies with that sort of profile. So it's not like capital was misallocated, it, it, it's common sense. But there is, those companies are now very rich and, uh, and there may be some better opportunities going down the quality scale or the, the cap size scale. Got it, nice. Uh, all right, so right now, the equity side, is it balanced with bonds or is there still a risk that we have uh, persistent inflation and the bonds don't hedge stocks well? Because I wanna work into some of the other asset classes in your approach here. Sure. Um, I mean, in, in our bond portfolio, we are relatively short duration, under three years, um, in corporates as well as treasuries on average. And we are opportunistically looking for, you know, corporates that, that maybe give us a better yield. And we have seen some nominal yields that are 
five, six, seven percent. You know, there's there's some opportunities in the short duration corporate market, and we've been taking advantage of that. But we do see volatility in interest rates still. So we didn't go long on duration like a lot of other funds did, you know, a few months ago. Not saying it's wrong, but it may have been premature. Our view has been more higher for longer. Let's wait and see. Let's see, stay relatively short. It's, it's safer on the balance sheet. And you're still getting returns that are more properly aligned with at the moment. And, and this week, for example, you're seeing the 10-year back up, right? Um, after a phenomenal move in, in the last part of last year. So we don't know quite yet where interest rates are going to settle. And, uh, and our view is to you know, take what the market's giving us and wait for more factors before we start to extend our duration. Okay. Tell me about the factors that go into the alternative side and the metals. Uh, as uh, you've been a fan of gold, there's a lot of gold haters, uh, but it seems like they were disproven last year as gold got to an all-time high. It's kind of uh, choked up a little bit since then, uh, but still pretty good compared to uh, the other kind of risk-adjusted returns across asset classes the last two years. So have you built up that position, kept it the same? How does that fit in? Um, we've both added and trimmed strategically because our model um, allows for us to have some component in gold at all times. So uh, we still like it for all the same reasons we already have, you know, we always have. The dollar is very high right now. It's, it's you know, the last decade or so, the dollar has been very high. We think in the longer term, that's probably unsustainable. We think it's probably going to weaken over time vis-a-vis um, -vis other currencies. That's a headwind to gold. We think a lot of central banks, or we see a lot of central banks continuing to buy it. That's a headwind. Um, so we, and, and if the Fed is truly done and begins cutting, gold traditionally performs very well in that environment because the real return on interest rates declines you know, the after inflation return on interest rates decline with, with declining rates. And so gold becomes more attractive. And when you look at the geopolitical issues out there, the uncertainties, the, the conflicts in the Ukraine or Taiwan or the Middle East, um, you know, threats to the financial and economic system, gold is a haven for those environments. So uh, we do believe that as a portion of a portfolio, a well-balanced portfolio, you want to have an, an anchor of some sort with gold in the portfolio. Okay. Not the, uh, the only uh, metal that you like, though. You've got a piece in copper through Freeport. Uh, last point I want to get to, is that kind of balance that uh, commodity and equity somewhere riding that fence? Well, we own, we own several commodities through equities, Freeport being one of them. We also own silver. Silver is kind of a hybrid between the, the, the store of value properties of gold and an industrial metal. It's more cyclical, maybe more volatile and more weighted to economic activity than maybe gold is from time to time. But And so I would put it in that middle category. Then you have things like nickel and copper and you know lithium and, and a variety of other materials that we think this is a longer term story that may take a while to play out. But for a patient investor that has a strong stomach, we think companies like a Freeport, like a BHP, Billiton, like a Rio, maybe some smaller ones as well, Albemarle on the lithium front. Um, given the, the transition to green, given likely economic activity growing at some point, being a lack of supply with possibly increasing demand globally, um, we think this is a good place to be for a long-term total investor. Um, and so these companies generally pay dividends. They generally increase their dividends when times are good. And we think with a weaker dollar, that would be a tailwind. We think the supply demand dynamics will work in these companies long term favor for a while. So, again, as an allocation to a broader portfolio and as part of our whether it's equities or just the, the hard metals, we do believe a, an appropriate allocation is warranted. And that's why we have it. All right. Always like the walk through here, the strategy. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Thanks, Oliver. Anytime. You got it. Michael Cugino, president at the Por Permanent Portfolio Family of Bonds.